Hello, everyone. We thank you for joining us for our Sunday morning roundtable discussion. And uh, we are recording today from the Plainfield Christian Science Church, Plainfield, New Jersey, the United States of America. And thank you. Our subject today is mortals and immortals. And we will start with our morning prayer. I'm reading from page 222 of Divinity Course in General Collectania. Abide in the 91st Psalm and know that such abiding is treatment and protection. There is nothing that can make laws or influence you. There is but one mind and that is love. Do not give life to evil by attaching it to a personal thing. It cannot live without a body. Man is immortal one. There is but one infinite manifestation. No error can attach itself to man, and why deceive ourselves by thinking it can do so? Every manifestation of life is ever-present and omnipresent good, and this carries within itself all healing, sustaining. Know that the kingdom of heaven is within you, and this is your armor. Mary Baker Eddy. Beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. And the watching point. Watch number 41. Watch lest you believe that in certain directions Christian science does not condemn what the world calls sin because it encourages that dissatisfaction with mortal existence which often leads mortals to sin. Jesus said, quote, I am not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance, unquote. Evidently, he felt that the consciousness in which the seeds of sin had developed and borne the fruit of suffering was more receptive to truth than the one that contained in embryo seeds, as every mortal consciousness does, where, because they had not ripened into action, mortal man believed that he was more or less free from sin, and hence righteous. No one seeks truth until he feels that he needs it. One cannot declare that he is righteous until he has cleansed his thought of all materiality. The self-satisfied or self-righteous mentality is not open to the approach of Christ truth. Thank you. And comments? I was thinking about Judas. You know, Judas probably had never betrayed anyone before, certainly not like that. And it wasn't until he was put in that position that it happened, you know. But it, I'm sure he saw things along the way that could have alerted him to it if he wasn't, you know, allowing himself to be blind to it. So, Thank you very much. I guess the same with Peter and denying the Christ. So. Yeah, the um, Carpenter books, especially Precepts, it, it talks a lot about the Judas thought, which is very interesting. Um, someday we will talk about it at the round table but not today yeah the temptation to think that you're better off than you really are or that you're further along in your spiritual growth than you really are so that's why it's essential to be humble and start each day by realizing that uh, of myself I can do nothing and without God, I am nothing. And let the winds of God blow. It may be uncomfortable, and it should be uncomfortable, but it's that's the purification process. And we've all had to go through it. Um, yes. <laughs> Still going through it. Probably will continue to go through it as long as we're here on this earth. <laughs> And as we've talked about, Jesus had his most severe rebukes for the self-righteous thought, because they are the ones that aren't ready to give up their 
their self-righteousness. And, and therefore they are shut to, to new ideas and divine ideas. I keep picturing the, um, the scene at the well. Anybody who's watched The Chosen is that that scene is just so sweet. And, but I keep picturing how she, her thought obviously was um, that the light of the Christ truth just came upon her and um, how happy and it's just like, I just keep seeing that face. And but her thought had to be open, um, and I just I thought that I just keep thinking about that scene, especially this week. Yes, yes. The lesson. Yeah, me too. Yeah, she was fed up with the ways of the world, wasn't she? Mm-hmm. Yeah. She'd gone, she'd gone through five husbands. <laughs> it was yeah. Ready. She was ready for. Yes, it's interesting because that is one of, in one of the interviews with that Jonathan Rumi who plays Jesus' role, he said that was one of his most favorite scenes was that and that woman, her joy. Um, Anne from England, she writes, in trying to better understand the conversation between Jesus and the woman of Samaria, and I like this part of the commentary from the Cambridge Bible schools and colleges, enlarging on why Jesus asked the woman to call her husband to come hither. Go call thy husband, is the quote. And she writes, not that the man was wanted, either as a concession to Jewish priority, which forbade a rabbi to talk with a woman alone, or for any other reason, by a seemingly casual request, Christ lays hold of her inner life, convinces her of sin, and leads her to repentance, without which her request, give me this water, could not be granted. The husband, who was no husband, was the plague spot where her healing must begin. So I thought that was, he he drew out of her the problem the plague spot, the trouble. And you, you saw that in the, in the movie, too. Mm. Husbands had not been a joy to her, had they? <laughs> and he pulled that out of her, and that is what enabled the healing to take place. So, she had to confess, right? Yes, yes. She had to admit to it. She had to see it. You know, she couldn't hide it. It had to come out, and he just just by that one question, because as as it was said, it was a nonsensical question. Because, <laughs> but he did it for a purpose to pull that out of her, for that confession, for that healing, for that repentance, and it happened. And you could see it in that movie. It all happened. She was transformed, and that is what brought about the healing. She dropped the old man for the new. And it happened in, yes, it would seem instantaneously, but in just a few moments' time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. For all that to transpire. So, um, now I just wanted to say a few words because, um, in some ways I hate to bring it up, but, you know, America had another shooting. And... um, these things are very troublesome, um, and in praying about it, you know, I, I you ask, how long, Lord? Why does this keep having to happen? My gosh! And what is the answer to how, how long, Lord? As long as you want it, as long as you deny yeah, I am all. Yes. Yeah. As long as you deny my allness, or something to that effect. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That's how long. And then I say it, and goodness, America, what is the matter? And and it came to much that has been given. What? Much is much is expected. Yes, we have been so abundantly given, and and Mrs. Eddy predicted that would happen. Materiality, 
Um, and if we don't use it for God's good purpose, and you know very well, this boy, and he, he was just a boy who did this terrible thing. He wasn't taught the Ten Commandments or the Sermon on the Mount, was he? No. No, he was not. He was not. You know, Mrs. Evans, and I think this is appropriate now, too. Mrs. Evans used to tell the story to us about... <clears throat> Um, well, uh, she would. She was so looking forward to this afternoon. She was going to go out in her backyard, put on her bathing suit, get some sun, and read gossip magazines. <laughs> and she was so looking forward to this. She was just going to have a happy time doing this. And after a few hours of this, she got a phone call from the school saying one of her children was sick. And her point was that when... Parents, if you will, don't do what they should, go off, especially those who much has been given, those who know better. If they don't get it, their children will get it. They, their children will be hit. She made this very clear, and I know in my own experience that was true. It was a discipline. You couldn't let your thought go off, or the next thing you'd be having some trouble with your children or somebody else you loved. And if you didn't have children, well, it could be somebody else, but some your pet or someone close to you we can't afford the indulgences that was her point of this and in our country and it maybe in our world it would seem our children uh because we haven't taught them what they need to know and if we don't teach them the truth someone else is sitting out there waiting to teach them something else mm -hmm. we have a responsibility and we, we pray for certainly those we love, but then all mankind, and, and to pray to, to protect the innocent. These people were just out grocery shopping, for heaven's sakes. So we mustn't let down in this work. And there's, there's no rational explanation of error, is there? There never is. It's, it's, it makes no sense at all. And there never will be. And there never will be. But, you know, I must get discouraged. I was wrestling with that last night because that's just what Eric would like us to do, to give up. And uh, the answer we know is in truth, in science, Christ, Christianity. They can de debate and talk about all of what they think is the answers, but it's only in this. It's only in this. We need to get the Bible back in our schools, back in our homes. We need Christ's Christianity. I mean, this is just a, a shout, a shout, a cry for the truth. The world desperately needs the truth. It needs a Christianity that is real. It's love for one another that it overcomes all of it. That is it. it. Exactly. It's love. It's a golden rule. And, and all... Everyone should be taught that. And many are, and many of those who've never gone into a church have more of a sense of it than some that are churchgoers. It really doesn't matter. It just matters that you feel that in your heart and you have it and you love, you love one another. And um, so we keep the work up. It's only, it's coming out in very ugly manifestations. It can't be hidden anymore. Our need for Christ Christianity. And so that leads me to, uh, you know, a very, I thought very comforting um, what Jacob wrote on our forum. I think it's Jacob, right? Yeah. Okay. No. <laughs> I better qualify myself. <laughs> and we haven't heard from him in a long time. So if he's listening, hi, Jacob. He's our member from uh, the Netherlands. Anyway, I'll have Gary read it. <clears throat> Jacob writes, mortals and immortals. What does God know about this? I saw this mortal mind constantly projecting its own mirage world or creation of discords, sin, disease, and death, war, and sufferings untold. When I saw a room full of people receiving chemotherapy, poison poured into their veins, my soul cried out, Oh my God, how far have we strayed from you? source of all goodness and blessing. The divine mind could ask, 
Where is there something wrong? Is it here? That is impossible because I am here, omnipresent good. Is it over there? No way. I am there too. I am ever I am everywhere. Mortal mind is not. Mortal mind is the omni absence of omnipresence. God's thoughts mm -hmm. omnipresent in my mind, creating in me a kingdom of harmony and health. When we think as God thinks, we find God taking place. It all takes place in our inner being, our thinking and feeling. Omnipresence is omnipotence, truth and love, all in all. For of mind and through mind and to mind is all. Romans 11, verse 36. Thank God we have not to struggle with matter or with the reality. We just must allow mind to be omnipresent as us. Find yourself as mind. And then wait patiently for divine love to move upon the water of mortal mind. Thank you. I found that very comforting and applying to this situation, too. And We'll just put a blessing of love on the whole thing. Pour out the love and know that love is the answer. And love heals. Love heals. So, any comments on anything? All right, Bill, you can read our golden text. The gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Okay, that is... Um, the truth, and we know in this lesson, mortals and immortals, that they're not two of us, are there? No. no. We're just the one, just immortal. And we must keep that uppermost in our thinking all the time. I know that's a struggle. I know that was one of the questions last week, that what about this mortal body? Well, the more you see it as God sees it, the more you know the truth about it, the more you will see it as immortal, an immortal life. And that is true. There is no death. There's no death. And that's another truth we can know for these dear folks. And that's because God is all and God governs all. And there can't be anything unlike God or anything that God does not govern. And somewhere, Mrs. Eddy says, uh, spirit governs matter. Yeah. <laughs> so, from the human standpoint, that's, that's the direction. That's the priority. And, you know, gifts, gifts of God are referred to in the Bible. Some people think of God as a capricious superhuman who gives gifts sort of you know to some people but not to others but in Christian science Mrs. Eddy explains that these gifts are not they're universal and it's more than a gift it's a law so there's no capriciousness in God's giving because God, God is all. So what we receive from God is universal, it is all the time, and it is forever. And there is nothing else for us to accept. Thank you. And Linda, you want to share what you gave on the forum as well? I looked up some words from the quote about um, where Mrs. Eddy writes, quote, life is eternal and we should find this out and begin the demonstration thereof. Life and goodness are immortal. Let us shape our views of existence into loveliness, freshness, and continuity rather than into age and blight, and, end quote. And then uh, continuity was uh, uninterrupt, uninterrupted, ceaseless, it's a connection, uninterrupted. 
and freshness was not stale, sour, decayed, unimpaired, not altered, made anew and free from taint. And then loveliness is harmony, lovable, and beauty. And uh, I just love when we look up words and think more deeply about what they mean and use it, because uh, it's said to shape our views. And so that's just what you were just saying now, not that we need to see our bodies or our world as God sees it. Thank you. Yes. And it's so important. Think about what you do think about during the day. And are you thinking of these beautiful concepts and not age and blight? Because you see, we get age and blight thrown at us all the time. Loveliness, freshness, continuity, they're beautiful words. And and the, the next citation nine in science and health beauty as well as truth is eternal glory of its own the radiance of soul higher conceptions of loveliness and um the immortality of life possessing unlimited divine beauty and goodness without a single bodily pleasure or pain all of those things think on these things think on these things and you will find your immortality shining forth much more than if you're all concerned with your physical conditions or your age or light and all of that. Jeremy, did you have something? Oh, well, I just remembered and Gary, Gary has been reading from the first edition, recording it. And yesterday it said, you, the intelligence, embrace the body in comprehension and completeness. Put away then the error of belief that matter embraces you in mystery and disease. You, the soul and circumference of being, for the body is but the idea of you, are a law to your members, and the lawgiver that makes your body discordant or harmonious according to ignorance or understanding, the error or truth that governs it. Yeah. So I just like that. The body is but the idea of you. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> yes. And I also wanted to say, when we put for freshness, one of the things was not altered. When I was putting German translations on the website, age is alter. It's, that's oh, that's translation. <laughs> really interesting. Oh. I ever said. <laughs> so, yes. So don't be altered. Don't be altered. I'm yeah. changing God, right? Mm-hmm. Yes. Beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. One of the things, too, that we go a little farther down, it says it clings steadlessly to God. And I thought that had the same idea with shape your views. But I, the new definition for cling was to resist spreading. So wow. to resist sickness or sin from spreading and cling to God. I don't know. I just really love it. That's wonderful. Mm-hmm. Resist spreading. Yeah, by holding on. So by holding on to God, you're resisting the spreading somehow. That's how it was worded. Well, all that is beautiful, and that is true, and that's why we do hold on to God. And that's a wonderful statement, that 495, 14 to 24, to to memorize, that when the illusion of sickness or sin tempts you, Mm -hmm. to cling steadfastly to God and his idea. Yeah, and that is by holding on, you resist it from spreading. (laughs) Hold on to God, focus on him, and then you won't have all these problems spreading here, there, and everywhere, (laughs) which we know how that happens if we don't obey these wonderful, beautiful precepts in science and health and in the Bible. And the fact that there's no age in God, so if I remain the reflection, then where is the age? Yes. Thank you. Unaltered. So all of those are important to to stay with. And then the responsive reading this week is the 23rd Psalm. And I know we've had, I think, a whole maybe roundtable or Bible study on it. But today I felt like I needed comfort food. (laughs) So we're going to do it some more. I've had some articles I haven't been able to share with you on the 23rd Psalm that are very beautiful as well. Um, anyone else wanted to say anything, Jeremy? Okay. All right. Well, this is, um, this is something. It's by a Ted Pavlov. Anyway, the 23rd Psalm, God covers everything we need 
in 117 words. And he says, contrary to the belief of most of the world and the church today, Psalm 23 was not written to be used primarily for funerals. You know, that is true. We always, in movies and stuff. <laughs> anyway, unfortunately, many thousands of people read that psalm only on the occasions of bereavement, and they miss the beautiful promise of provision for everything we need in order to maintain and enjoy life. Certainly, we can draw comfort from these words when we lose a loved one. But let's not relegate these beautiful words to being hidden away and kept for that purpose alone. Let's take a fresh look at Psalm 23 today and celebrate these glorious facts about our God and his provision for every aspect of our lives here and now. And in this, there's a dearest little picture of lambs. And I have to say that Izzy from England, who gave the testimony about the lambing, the birth of these little lambs, she sent us the sweetest pictures of these little lambs. And we'll have to spread them all over the Liberator and everywhere we can. They have the sweetest little faces. I sent some to Florence, right, Florence? They were yeah, beautiful, really beautiful. Mm. Show the love of God. Mm. Yes, yes. All right, then he says, this is very good. The Lord is my shepherd. That's relationship. I shall not want. That is supply. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. That is rest. He leadeth me beside the still waters. That is refreshment. He restoreth my soul. That is healing. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness. That is guidance. For his name's sake, that is purpose. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, that is testing. I will fear no evil. That is protection. For thou art with me. That is faithfulness. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. That is discipline. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. That is hope. Thou anointest my head with oil. That is consecration. My cup runneth over. That is abundance. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. That is blessing. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord. That is security. Forever. That is eternity. And then he writes, face it. The Lord is crazy about you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my. <laughs> so we all need to face it. The Lord is crazy about us. <laughs> Look at all the things that God does for us. In that one psalm, it's a total, complete treatment, isn't it? Yeah. So, again, the early morning hours or when you're out and about, Think of that beautiful psalm. Say it to yourself. You should all have it memorized. I'm sure you do, as well as the 91st. And, you know, if you have any ideas, well, now we have the 121st coming up in the May Liberator. If you have any ideas for the July Liberator, um, please send it, send them to us. I have considered maybe that the last psalm would be maybe the 27th psalm. If we do that, that's a beautiful one as well. I mean, they're all beautiful, but some are particular. <laughs> so then I'm going to share with you. This was uh, excerpts from an article by Spurgeon. So beautiful on the 23rd Psalm that Carrie had sent to me a while ago, and I hadn't used it. Um, and so just sit back and listen because it's very helpful. Um this is called the Pearl of Psalms, Spurgeon on Psalm 23. 
Psalm 23 is undoubtedly one of the most well-known passages in the scripture. It adorns walls and faithful churches and fills frames in Christian homes. David's song is betrayed in non-religious circles too, making appearances in many secular movies and other entertainment mediums, though not often recited in its entirety. Then he goes on about Spurgeon. Um, the noteworthiness of Psalm 23 was not lost on Spurgeon. In fact, he thought quite highly of it, as is evident by his this especially generous compliment. Of this delightful song, it may be affirmed that its piety and its poetry are equal, its sweetness and its spirituality are unsurpassed. So, and then here are some of the eloquent comments he writes on the various verses. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. The sweetest word of the whole is that monosyllable, my. He does not say, the Lord is the shepherd of the world at large and leadeth forth the multitude of his flock, but the Lord is my shepherd. If he be a shepherd to no one else, he is a shepherd to me. He cares for me, watches over me, and preserves me. The words are in this present tense. Whatever be the believer's position, he is now, he is even now under the pastoral care of Jehovah. It is not only I do not want, but I shall not want. Come what may, if famine should devastate the land or calamity destroy the city, I shall not want. Old age with its feebleness shall not bring me any lack, and even death with its gloom shall not find me destitute. I have all things and abound. Not because I have a good store of money in the bank, not because I have skill and wit with which to win my bread, but because the Lord is my shepherd. The wicked always want, but the righteous never. A sinner's heart is far from satisfaction, but a gracious spirit dwells in a palace of content. And then, two, he maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. What are these green pastures but the scriptures of truth, always fresh, always rich, and never exhausted? There is no fear of biting the bare ground where the grass is long enough for the flock to lie down in it. Sweet and full are the doctrines of the gospel, fit food for souls as tender grass is natural nutriment for sheep. What are these still waters? but the influences and graces of his blessed spirit. His spirit attends us in various operations like wa waters, in the plural, to cleanse, to refresh, to fertilize, to cherish. They are still waters, for the Holy Ghost loves peace and sounds no trumpet or ostentation in his operations not to raging waves of strife, but to peaceful streams of holy love does the Spirit of God conduct the chosen sheep. He is a dove, not an eagle, the dew, not the hurricane. Three, mm -hmm. he restoreth my soul, he leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Are any of us low in grace? Do we feel that our spirituality is at its lowest ebb? He who turns the ebb of the flood can soon restore our soul. Pray to him then for the blessing. Restore thou me, thou shepherd of my soul. Some Christians overlook the blessing of sanctification and yet to be and yet a thoroughly renewed heart this is one of the sweetest gifts of the covenant. 
if we could be saved from wrath and yet remain unregenerate sinners, we should not be saved as we desire, for we mainly and chiefly pant to be saved from sin and led in the way of holiness. And then, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Yea, though I walk as if the believer did not quicken his pace when he came to die, but still calmly walked with God. To walk indicates the steady advance of a soul which knows its road, knows its end, resolves to follow the path, feels quite safe, and is therefore perfectly calm and composed. Observe that it is not walking in the valley, but through the valley. We go through the the tunnel and emerge into the light of immortality. It is not the valley of death, but the valley of the shadow of death. For death in its substance has been removed and only the shadow of it remains. Nobody is afraid of a shadow, for a shadow cannot stop man's pathway even for a moment. The shadow of a dog cannot bite. The shadow of a sword cannot kill. The shadow of death cannot destroy us. Let us not, therefore, be afraid. I will fear no evil. He does not say there shall not be any evil. He had got beyond even that high assurance and knew that Jesus had put all evil away. But I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. This is the joy of the Christian. The little child out at sea in the storm is not frightened like all other passengers on the board of the vessel. It sleeps in the mother's bosom, and it is enough that the mother is with him, and it should be enough for the believer to know that Christ is with him. And then thou prepares the table before me in the presence of my enemies, Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. The good man has his enemies. He would not be like his Lord if he had not. If we were without enemies, we might fear that we were not the friends of God. For the friendship of the world is an enmity to God. And thou preparest a table. Nothing is hurried. There is no confusion, no disturbance. The enemy is at the door, and yet God prepares a table, and the Christian sits down and eats as if everything were in perfect peace. Ah, the peace which Jehovah gives to his people, even in the midst of the most trying circumstances. You know, I was thinking that's also what we see in the chosen. Remember, all kinds of disturbances would go on, and yet Christ was ever at peace. Whoever he was facing, whatever it was, right? And that was the piece that Florence was talking about yesterday. That kind of piece is important, (laughs) that equanimity. May we live in a daily enjoyment of this blessing, receiving uh, a fresh anointing for every day's duty. Every Christian is a priest, But he cannot execute the priestly office without unction, and hence we must go day by day to the Holy Ghost, that we may have our heads anointed with oil. And then what? All this, and Jesus Christ too. And then the last, surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. This is a fact as indisputable as it is encouraging, and therefore a heavenly, verily, or surely is set as a seal upon it. This sentence may read, Only goodness and mercy, for there shall be unmingled mercy in our history. These twin guardian angels will always be with me at my back and at my beck. Goodness and mercy 
follow him always, all the days of his life, the black days as well as the bright days, the days of fasting as well as the days of feasting, the dreary days of winter as well as the bright days of summer. Goodness supplies our needs and mercy blots out our sins. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. While I am here, I will be a child at home with my God. The whole world shall be in his house to me. And when I ascend unto the upper chamber, I shall not change my company, nor even change the house. I shall only go to dwell in the upper story of the house of the Lord forever. May God grant us grace to dwell in the serene atmosphere of this most blessed psalm. Beautiful. It, it is very beautiful. Dear Spurgeon was so wise in many of his sayings. And what was his timeline? He was around Mrs. Eddy's time or maybe a little before or something. But, um, yeah, he preceded her but was also a contemporary for a while. Mm-hmm. It shows the truth was working. It does, and um, abide in these psalms, and and work to know that all mankind does, and and we will shorten the times of this, as I call it, the reign of Jezebel, where all this, um, where a lot of disturbing activities are going on. Because along with the disturbing activities, there's great good going on. They don't get the advertisement, but they are. Just like in that beautiful uh, movie, Woodlawn, we watched not long ago, a revival was going on, a wonderful revival, where at the same point there seemed to be a lot of hatred going on. There was also a lot of good and people turning to God, right? Yeah, and that is that that is the progress. Because when the evil comes out, it comes out for what purpose? To destroy, to destroy itself. itself. To be exactly. So we we welcome the re, we welcome the revivals. We welcome evil coming out from undercover, <laughs> so that we can have our revivals. Putting on the new man. Yeah, the the lesson speaks this week that what we quote often, either through science or suffering. And uh, so we see that. One side, discord and dismay. The other side, science and peace. So, again, I'm always saying, stay in the Father's house. Stay in the ark. (laughs) Don't come out. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean we don't do our work and mingle with, with others and are part of this world. But we stay in the Christ consciousness. Don't come down to hatred, resentment, fear, all of that. Because that's the only way Eric can find you. Now, there was another um, couple of beautiful articles, one that Carrie also found by Samuel Greenwood. He's one of my favorite writers. Mm-hmm. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> he writes with great clarity. And this one is called the necessity for individual work. And um, I'll just read a little bit of it as well, because this is a point Christian scientists, some don't really want to take part in, right? The individual, the work of it. He writes, the desire to be good is the first essential to living a good life. But this desire alone does not bring that knowledge of God, which overcomes the sense of evil. There must also be the willingness to give effect to desire, the readiness to work one's way out of error, to be what one desires to be. Else a mortal will stagnate at that point, passively submissive to a false concept of being. Jesus preached the gospel of work as well as of faith and prayer and at no time encouraged the hope that the kingdom of heaven could be won without striving for it. Even at the eleventh hour, according to the parable, the call comes to work. The call comes to work. Quote, the works that I do shall he do also, was Jesus' message to his followers in all ages. 
And this article, we can have it on the, in the Liberator, it goes on just about the importance of um, principle makes each individual to work out his own problem. The ignorance of God that holds mankind in the sense of sin and its effects can be removed only through a knowledge of God. And this knowledge is science. And science requires demonstration, and demonstration involves work. Undeserved blessings are seldom appreciated or retained because no place has been prepared for them. Right? I mean, if unless you work for the goal, you don't even appreciate it. That's true in life altogether. So this is this is work. It takes work. He he talks about, you know, working at it all the time, day and night. Um People wanted to accept salvation as a gift, if they might, but to struggle moment by moment, day in and day out, to have only that mind which is in Christ Jesus requires more than most people are willing to do. It only comes through the overcoming. Are we ready to work as well as to pray for the good we desire? And you see this, again, separates us from New Age or other things where they just want easy solutions. This requires taking up the, the cross and working. We want our immortality, right? Well, we have to work for it. And this yeah. other point, we, we have to allow our children <laughs> yes. to, to struggle sometimes. That's how they gain strength. We shouldn't do too much for our children. But they're lucky because they we're looking at them all the time, and and uh, they get little bits of what they need. <laughs> they, well, they do exactly. Yep. And um, Carol found another beautiful article, Bible Lessons by Mrs. Eddie, which definitely will be in the in the new liberator, but she's saying the same thing. Um, the scriptures require more than a simple admission and acceptance of the truths they present. They require a living faith in them that so incorporates their lessons into their lives, they become the motive power of every act. <laughs> You, you can read about it, and it brings great comfort and growth. But, and this is what so many Christian scientists say, they, they don't connect. You've got to connect it by living it. You can read the Sermon on the Mountain and hate everybody. Go ahead, Florence. <laughs> no, no, I, I'm just laughing. It's the practice of it. It says science and health say so. Truth has been given us. We must practice it. Yes. Just bring it to our life. And that's what I'm so grateful for in, in coming here. Mrs. Evans, I heard, you know, oh, I see. I can use this. I don't just read it and, and leave it, but I can use this. When something comes up during the day, I can use such and such. I said, oh, wow. It works. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Oh, wow. is right. It works. Yeah. Wonderful. Mm -hmm. It's amazing. And... You know, because it's not practical in many churches, is why the churches are empty. Mm -hmm. It has to be. How does it change your life? How are you using it? And that requires some striving and some work, and it doesn't come easy. Is any work easy? But it's well mm -hmm. worth the effort. Even, even the simple uh, one in Paul, I think, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And, you know, I wake up and there'll be so many things to do. And just to think that, yes, this truth is true. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. <laughs> just using it, actually using it helps. Yes. You know, it to you mm -hmm. When you feel without strength, you turn to that and, and work with it. And help it. then at the end of the day, you say, wow. It worked. I did it. I got through everything. <laughs> Hallelujah. I had, a, 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 if I may, a little experience um, this week, actually. I, um, I've been dealing with my grandkids. Um, my daughter 
uh, asked me to come over to Florida and to help her out with the boys. And um, when I got here, well, the house was a mess. And being a mom, I immediately started, you know, picking up. Well, by the following day, I was like, this is impossible. I cannot do it. And what Florence said, I can do all things with Christ that threatened me, came to my mind. And, and I just kept repeating that. And I have to tell you, I, I was able to clean up quite a bit. I was amazed and um, did not feel tired afterwards. I was able to move quite easily. And I just, I was so grateful to remember that. Um, and I just kept repeating it, repeating it, repeating it. I don't care if I don't say anything else, but I'm going to do this. And I'm going to do it with the strength of Christ. And boy, it does, it does work. It works very well. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Good, good example. All right, well, our bell is rung, and um, Gary's going to end with the deer's cry. You're going to hear it with a, a, a hymn written by St. Patrick entitled The Deer's Cry. I arise today through the strength of heaven, light of the sun, splendor of fire, speed of lightning, swiftness of the wind, depth of the sea, stability of the earth, firmness of the rock. I arise today through God's strength to pilot me, God's might to uphold me, God's wisdom to guide me, God's eye to look before me, God's ear to hear me, God's word to speak for me, God's hand to guard me, God's way to lie before me, God's shield to protect me, God's hosts to save me, afar and anear, alone or in a multitude. Christ shield me today against wounding, Christ with me, Christ before me, Christ behind me, Christ in me, Christ beneath me, Christ above me, Christ on my right, Christ on my left, Christ when I lie down, Christ when I sit down, Christ in the heart of everyone who thinks of me, Christ in the mouth of everyone who speaks of me. Christ in the eye that sees me. Christ in the ear that hears me. I arise today through the mighty strength of the Lord of creation. End quote. Thank you. Thank you. You have the meaning of all the earth. <laughs> yes. Yes, thank you, Florence. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you.